We are in part six of a series that we've been calling OK, how simple obedience can move the heart of the Father. And I believe that, man, if you and I can begin to posture ourselves in such a way where we can discern the voice of God and walk in the voice of God, say yes to God more maybe than we currently are, our whole life could be different. And today's going to be a little bit of a different message because we've been reading about people that even if they gave a little bit of pushback, even in that moment, said okay. But uh, I want to I want to talk about a group of people um, that really messed up, a group of people that really messed up, and that you and I can probably relate a great deal to. And the title of my message today is "The Disciples Said It." The disciples said okay. And in Matthew chapter twenty six, verse thirty, it reads like this: It says. And when they had sung a hymn, this is the disciples and Jesus, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered him, though they all fall away. This is why Peter didn't have many friends. <laughs> though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, Peter, you're the worst. <laughs> I was ad-libbed. He says, truly, I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows, you're going to deny that you even know me three times. And Peter said to him, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same thing. And if you've been around church at all, you know the story. You know that all of the 11 disciples, there were 12 disciples, but Judas betrayed Jesus and went and ended his own life, and the other 11 did just as Jesus had predicted, and they all denied him. They all walked away from him. And in Matthew chapter 28, verse 16, now Jesus has been resurrected, and it says, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them, and when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and he said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and in the name of the Son and in the name of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The disciples said it. Let's pray together for the preaching of God's word. God, thank you so much, Lord, that you are the God of second chances and third chances, and tenth chances, and so on, and so on. You are indeed a gracious, gracious God. And so, Lord, teach us how to recover and get back on track and remind us of just how good you are, Lord. In Jesus' name, we all said amen. Amen. Uh, anybody in here play golf or you like golf? Uh, let me see again. Any golfers in the room? Yeah. Uh, if, if you're not a golfer in the room, uh, I, I want to explain uh, kind of just, you know, how golf maybe starts to play out and, uh, and, and kind of what the routine of a golfer is when we show up to the golf course. And uh, uh, one of the routines, right, is you, you kind of show up and you go through this process and everybody has a slightly different one, but you warm up a little bit, right? You warm up a little bit. And so, so you go out to the range, you go out to the driving range. And what's interesting about the driving range is, uh, uh, first of all, we love the driving range because it's big, it's massive, right? And so you kind of go out there, you bring some clubs, and you put a ball down. And when you put a ball down, you put it down on ideal grass, right? You're putting it down on ideal grass in an ideal situation, and you're picking kind of what club you want, and you, you hit the ball, right? And you're kind of, you're kind of warming up. And, and when you hit the ball, the fairway of a driving range is massive. This is why we all feel like we're better golfers than we actually are. Right, Because on the range, we're like, man, that's why every time you go golfing with somebody, they'll, they might say something like this, man, I was hitting it so good on the range. Well, of course you were, because the range was like 500 yards wide, and a fairway is like 40 yards wide, right? It's, of course you were hitting it better. And the other day I saw a video, a little meme video that made me laugh. And you know those kind of videos that you see and you kind of send them to some people, Right? I saw one of these videos, golf videos, and it made me laugh. And the whole premise of the video was, hey, when you're out on the driving range, you should probably practice shots that you're actually going to hit out on the golf course, right? 
And, and, and so what the guy did is, you know, it, it was a joke. And so he would have like the ball there on the grass. And then he put like a huge tree branch behind him. And, and, and he's kind of, he can't really take a full swing. And so he just kind of hacks it out, right, of the trees. Because that's probably more realistic to the type of shots that you are probably going to be hitting. And then there was this other one where he kind of has to hit it left-handed because it's butted up next to a tree. And the whole joke was, look, on the range, you're hitting shots that you're not going to hit. Why? Because the reality of life on the course is it's not always idyllic. And, and can I tell you, I think that's a great analogy for life. I, I, I think so much of life is, like you and I are so good in idyllic situations, right? When the weather's good, when we have eaten, when we've gotten good rest and we've gotten good sleep and we feel good and nobody has annoyed us today and, you know, our sandpaper people are far from us and we're feeling good. Right, we, that is you and I out on the range setting the golf ball down. But the reality of life is this. If you are not good at what is called in the golf world the recovery shot, you're gonna struggle. If you do not know how to recover some no's, if you do not know how to recover from some disobedient moments or seasons, because can we be honest, I know we're in church but can we be a little honest? You ever have God kind of tell you to do something, and I don't mean audibly, but you just kind of sense you're supposed to do something. Man, we're supposed to partner with that project. Man, we're supposed to give this. I'm supposed to forgive this person. I'm supposed to do this or do it. And you just get a sense that the Lord is like telling you to do something. And since we're in a series on obedience, can we be honest with each other? Sometimes we sense those things from God, and we might not say it out loud, but we give him a metaphorical, nah. We've had moments. And can I tell you, 10 times out of 10 that I told God, nah, it has required me to then hit a recovery shot. It has required me to recover. And here's my main point today, it's this, is that recovery is the first step of obedience after disobedience. Recovery is the first step of obedience after disobedience. And if we're being honest, you're going to have to recover. And so have I. We have all had to recover. We have all had to bounce back after a no type of season. And in Matthew chapter 26, verse 30, it says this. It says, all the disciples, they just finished singing a hymn. And they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, you will fall away because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered, but after I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. <laughs> you ever have one of those moments where you're just feeling extra spiritual? You ever have one of those moments where, where, where you just, you're like, whew, you're like, you feel like you're getting ready to levitate at any moment, you just kind of, you just have one of those seas you just have one of those moments and you're like I feel very spiritual right now. Like I, I don't know what's going on in your life. Or I don't know what's going on in your life, but I'm super spiritual. You ever have one of those moments? You start making all these declarations to God like God, I'll go anywhere. And I'll do anything. Whatever you want. Like we've all had moments like for me, one of these moments for me was at my wedding. At my wedding. I had one of these moments. And it was oriented around this particular moment in the wedding. And on this particular moment, uh, you know, every couple, I, I do tons of weddings. Christina's done tons of weddings. And there's always a moment, hey, what's the first act that you want to do as a couple? And some couples do communion and uh, some couples do the sand thing. All, all kinds of different stuff. Well, Christina and I just wanted to be prayed over. And so there's this moment in the wedding. We have it, like a picture of it. It's beautiful. Like, like I'm on my knees kind of at this altar where we got married. And Christina's on her knees. And her father, who was a pastor at that time, is praying over us. And, and my best friend who's a pastor. He's like, my brother, he's praying over us. And her sister is singing How Deep the Father's Love for Us, which is like one of my favorite worship songs of all time. And you can feel the presence of God in this place. In fact, you could feel the presence of God so tangibly that her childhood best friend that wasn't walking with the Lord and had never kind of surrendered her life to Jesus starts bawling. 
And she starts bawling because she can just sense the goodness of God, the kindness of God, the love of God for the very first time. And she's bawling. She ends up giving her heart to Christ. And I, and I was like, man, this is, it was so powerful. And at that time, you couldn't have told me nothing. <laughs> at that time, if one of you would have ever came up to me and said, hey, you're, you're probably not going to be serving Jesus in about a year, there's no chance you could have told me that. Now, now you, you got to think about this for a second. Like the, the disciples are having one of these moments. The disciples are having maybe the most spiritual moment that they have ever had in their entire life. You got to think about this for a second. Like, in fact, right before what we just read, right before what we just read, Jesus has just instituted the Last Supper. So, right before this, like, Christine is awesome at what she just did but she's not Jesus. The disciples are sitting with Jesus himself, and he says, it, he's saying it in first person. See, when we do communion, right, we don't do it in the first person. We say, Jesus said, this is my body, broken for you. This is my blood. Jesus is like, hey, yo, this is my body. <laughs> and this is my blood. How powerful would that have been? And then it says, after they had sung a hymn. Now, you got to put yourself during the time. The hymn that they were singing is called the Hallel. And what the Hallel is, is it's really Psalm 113 to 118, right? And so Jesus was leading them in worship in a very particular song. Now, Chase is good. But he's not Jesus, and Jesus is leading them. And the way it would have worked, as Jesus playing the role of the worship leader, Jesus would have been communicating the lines from Psalm 113 to 118. And then once he said a line, the disciples would have then said back after every line, hallelujah. Jesus would have said a line and they would have said hallelujah. Jesus would have sang a line and they would have said hallelujah. This is what they are currently encountering. Could you imagine that? Could you imagine how spiritual, how stirred up, Jesus, I will go anywhere with you. And then Jesus, got, and he finishes the song. <laughs> in my name, amen. In my name, amen. <laughs> Some of you will get that later. It's okay. It's <laughs> and he says, hey, you're all going to fall away their response would have been totally understandable. Because in that moment, they're going, there's no way, Jesus. There's no way. Like, I am in forever. But the beautiful thing is he leaves them with a key bit of information. He tells them where he's going. He goes, hey, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go to Galilee. Now, here's what I believe. If you're gonna recover you need a break glass in case of emergency type of people and places. You're going to need those things. See, recovery is so much about key people and key places. Recovery is about key people and key places. Like we just got back from art conference and it's a conference where there's about 2,500, 3,000 pastors and uh, a, a lot of these guys are like fathers in the faith for Christina and I and mothers in the faith for us and, and then a lot of these people are like, like brothers that we, and sisters that we do life with that we feel like, you know, like kindred spirits with and, and there's some relationships there that are break glass in case of an emergency. Dino Rizzo, Pastor Chris Hodges, these are people that, listen, I don't have to talk to every week but if any anything ever went down, I could call and go, hey, uh, uh, we are struggling, we are not in a good place, and we need your help. You need some people like that. I'm so grateful that we have an incredible church council, uh, you know, with, with men and women that, that love Christina and I and believe in us and pray for us and give wise counsel and give us wisdom to help us kind of navigate some of the bigger decisions of the church. I'm, I'm grateful that I have peers that, that, that I, I hold on to as brothers and, and go, hey man, I'm struggling over this. Hey, I need your help. I'm so grateful that ultimately I have Jesus who is the redeemer of my soul, who loves me and calls me according to his purposes. Listen, if you don't have key people in key places, you will not be able to recover. 
This is why church is so important. Why? Because this is a key place that you can walk in here. In fact, most of the judgment that you usually have to get over is your own. Can't tell you how many times people go, oh, I, 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 would, I would feel so judged. No, 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 that's your innards speaking. That is what's going on right here and that is what's going on here. Here's what I know about Grace City Church. Man, we're a come all who are weary and heavy burden and he will give you rest type of church. You need some key places. S- some of you, and I know this because I, I've, I've walked with some, some of you, man, you found a rehab center, key place. It was a key place. Some of you, you've you went away from marriage intensives. Why? Because you needed it. It was a key place. And if you don't have key places, and if you don't have key people, recovery is very difficult. I love that Jesus says, hey, you're going to fall, but there's a key person and a key place that I will leave you with. And it was himself, and it was Galilee. He didn't just say, hey, figure it out on your own. Hey, just remember that I love you. He says, no, 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 you're gonna fall on your face and when you do, you will have a key person and you will indeed have a key place. See, I think many of us learned in church as we were growing up how to get to Jesus for salvation, but we never learned how to return to him for recovery. We learned, man, man, we need him for salvation, but we never learned, okay, what happens when I fall on my face? What happens when I have a moment of disobedience? But what's beautiful and great is, man, recovery is the first step, what? Of obedience after a moment of disobedience. Verse 33, Peter doesn't believe it. It says, Peter answered him, though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. And Jesus said to him, truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows, you're gonna deny that you know me three times. And Peter said to him, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. Peter couldn't wrap his mind around it. Have you ever gotten invited to something that you really didn't know what you had gotten invited to? Has has this ever happened to you? You got invited to something, you show up and you're like, whoa, this is not what I thought I got invited to. Um, This happened to me one time. In fact, I gotta be honest, I had totally forgotten about this memory until I was trying to think of a way to illustrate a time where I was invited to something and it wasn't what I thought I had gotten invited to and it actually has to do with church. Because I didn't really grow up going to church and the only time uh, that I really remembered uh, going to church was once for my parents' wedding some of you know, I, I was kind of raised by a single mom, and then my parents got married when I was about nine years old. And so I remember being at church for their wedding, and I didn't really go to church on Sundays, but I just remember this last week, oh, there was another time when I was like 13 years old that I got invited to something that was at a church, and it was supposed to be like an evangelistic type of thing. And I didn't remember it until just as I was thinking about this. And I got invited. Now, I'm curious how many people in this room even know what this is. How many people watching online even know what this is? But I got invited to a bell concert at my friend's Methodist church. Now, who knows what a bell concert, let me see your hand if you know what a bell, really? Hold on, keep your hand up. You knew what that was? That's crazy. I never, I was like, that's right, I went to a bell concert. At my friend's Methodist church when I was 13 years, I had totally forgot it, forgotten about it. I think I like blocked it out. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, I walked into this Methodist church, and it doesn't have to be, it could have been any church, but it was a Methodist church, and I walked in <laughs> to this Methodist church. And, and, and there were bells on these tables. All these, they were small bells. They were big bells. There were all these bells on these tables. And I'd never seen anything like this. And there were people standing behind these bells, and they were all wearing white gloves. And they start, doo, 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 like, they start doing their thing. They start, they start getting their bell on. And I'm sitting there, and I look over at my friend. I'm like, what? Like, what about me says that you think this is something I would enjoy? And I didn't think it could get any more fascinating 
But then some of these cats started rapping. It was like pre-spoken word, spoken word. And it's in the middle of the bell. So it's like, doo, Jesus went to Galilee. Doo, doo, doo. It's like, what? Am I experiencing? What am I encountering? And I didn't go to church for another four years <laughs> until I gave my heart to Jesus. Wasn't what I, because I'm there and I'm like, man, if this is church, I'm good. You guys can have the bells, man. I'm good. I'll keep listening to Tupac. Like, right? I'm good. Now, now you got to think about this for a second from like Peter's perspective. Right? In some ways, I kind of understand Peter's kind of like primal. Because after all, this thing is starting to look a little different than what he thought he had gotten invited to. Because what he thought he got invited to was like a relationship with Jesus where he just goes mountaintop to mountaintop to mountaintop. That's what he thought he got invited to. And after all, that kind of has been the story up until this point. Because he gets invited into a relationship with Jesus and then he's been walking around for a few years and all he's been seeing is dead people being raised, blind people seeing, deaf people hearing, Jesus preaching, um, the, you know, thousands of people being fed with a little bit of food. That's all he's been seeing. So he's like, oh, snap. This is great. This is what following Jesus is. What following Jesus is mountaintop to mountaintop to mountaintop, to mountaintop. And so his brain did not even have a paradigm for a valley with Jesus. He didn't even have, he didn't even have a paradigm for that. He didn't have a paradigm for I'm with Jesus and yet there's a moment of struggle. I, I, I'm, 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 I'm walking with Jesus, but I'm gonna make some foolish decisions. He had no paradigm for that. See, what, what he thought of Christianity was is just a conquering soldier. That was the image that he would have had in his mind. He did not yet have an understanding for a suffering savior. He didn't have an understanding of that. And so Jesus is trying to prepare him for that. He's trying to tell him, hey, you're gonna go through a difficulty. You're gonna go through some difficult things. And Peter is in one of those moments where the only thing that makes any sense is to follow Jesus wherever that may lead. And so his response and the agreement from the other disciples is almost primal. And most of us in this room, maybe all of us in this room, have made those statements to Jesus before. God, I'll never do this again. I'll only do this. I'll go where you send me. I will say what you tell me to say. I will do what you tell me to do. But then the divorce happens. And then the financial hardship happens. And then the loss of a key relationship happens. And then the career doesn't play out quite the way that you want it to. And those declarations that you made to God in that season feel like a million miles away. And the question isn't whether or not you and I will face those moments. It is, do we know where to go when we do? Do we know where to go? Do, 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 do we know? Or, or do we continue to dig a deeper hole? See, I, I can't tell you how many times I, I, I talk to people who think about making a change, but then they feel like, oh, I can't, I can't, I can't. And then three years later, we're having the same conversation, and I'm going, man, if you would have made the change three years ago when we first started this conversation, then you would be in a very, very different place. I can't tell you how many times I talk to people that felt like God was like put on their heart to like start college at like 23, 24 years old. And what do they always say? Man, I feel like I miss it. I feel like I'm too old. And then four years, they're having the same conversation. I'm going, man, if you would have started when you were 24 years old, when you thought you had missed it, when you thought you were too old, now you're 28 years old, you would have been done. And this game does not go to the perfect because none of us are. The game goes to those who know how to get to Galilee. Those who know how, man, when they fall on their face, listen, I'm not gonna stay in the dirt forever. I'm gonna get up, dust myself off because his grace is sufficient. What you have to understand is his grace is immediate. The renewal takes some time. See, his grace is sufficient. His grace is immediate. As soon as you say, God, forgive me, I missed it. As soon as the disciples were like, man, I missed it, I missed it, I missed it, God forgave them, but then it took them a minute to get to Galilee. They had to go. 
And in Matthew chapter 28, verse 16, I want the team to come up. I want to finish with this last thought. It says, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. See, I wonder how long it would have taken to dust themselves off, to wipe the tears from their eyes, to get over the shame and embarrassment, to make their way to the place that their Savior said that they could meet him. See, I think the miracle about this whole thing is that all 11 actually make it to Galilee. I mean, that's really the miracle. That they actually make it. Like, I wonder if you and I would have made it there. I wonder how many of us could have been able to dust ourselves off from the biggest spiritual embarrassment of their life. Listen, there's probably some of you in this room, you went through divorce, you've lied, you've cheated, you've stolen, you operated in anger, you're addicted to something. Embarrassing, and in fact, you don't even wanna share it with anybody because you're so embarrassed by it. These men denied literal Jesus. Denied him outright. Denied him outright. Uh, This is why I get so frustrated because so many of us in this room we're living under so much condemnation and so much guilt and so much shame. And Jesus would say to you today, if I can forgive the closest men to me for having denied me outright, I can forgive you. And the first step of obedience is recovery. It's the first step. And and we know this when it comes to other people. It's just so hard to operate like this with ourselves. You know, like, it feels so good. Every once in a blue moon, you'll get asked for directions, right? It doesn't happen as much anymore. But every once in a while, like, in fact, not that long ago, I got asked for directions. I was walking in my car. This guy came up to me, and he was in his car. He goes, hey, man, do you know how to get to, and I was coming out of a restaurant, and I was, now, now this is the greatest feeling in the world. When somebody asks you um, how to get to a place that you actually know how to get to, you're like, oh, man, this is my city. I got it on lock. <laughs> yes, I know how to get there, right? It feels so good. And this person asked me to get to a place I actually knew how to get to, and I'm like, oh, you're close. You're close. I got you told him how to get there. It felt so good. It felt amazing. It, because it feels good to help people get to places, right? This is why I love when people come to our church and they're like, oh man, I, I haven't been to church in 18 years, but I came and I've been here the last two weeks and I love it. Can I tell you, I get giddy. I get so excited. Not because they found Gray City. Not because they found Gray City, but because We know here how to get you to Galilee. We know how to point you to, we know where to point you. We know know the directions. And it feels good. And we are so good sometimes at doing this with other people. Sometimes we're terrible at doing it with ourselves. We're great at saying, man. Sometimes we can be so forgiving and so gracious to other people. And not the same with other people. I'm even like this with my kids on like a small, like silly level. Like if I break something in the house, it's like the end of the world. If my kids break something in the house, I'm like, hey bud, like let's try not to do that again, but I love you. <laughs> the other day, Christina got mad at me. <laughs> but she got mad at me because of how I was talking to myself. Uh, uh, Justice, uh, uh, we have turned our living room into a basketball court. And so we have these stairs, and at the top of the stairs, he's put like this little basketball hoop. And so he, he kind of shoots a little, little basketball hoop. And one time he was shooting, and I was walking by him, and I just ha, swatted his stuff. It felt so good. <laughs> he was shooting, I went, bam! And, and when I hit the ball, the ball goes, by the way, there's only been like three things that have broken in our living room from playing sports inside the house. I have done it every single time. Every single time. And I hit the ball, and when it hit the ball, it went and it hit a light fixture, and like the glass exploded. Christina comes out, and she's like, Justice, and he's like. (laughs) A little snitch. 
But what am I doing? I'm picking this stuff up and I'm just like berating myself. Like I'm, I'm picking this stuff up and I'm like, ah, idiot, God, why'd you do that? And I'm picking this up and Christine's like, stop it, stop it. She goes, one, I don't want our hit kids to hear you talking like that after a mistake. I'm like, you little PhD. <laughs> like you know stuff. <laughs> but what's funny, like, like Justice does stuff and, and I don't respond the same way. Can I tell you, stop beating yourself up. You are a child of God. You are a son of God. You are a daughter of God. That is who you are. And the goal isn't that we just rest on that and we just kind of stay where we're at. The goal is that we get up, dust ourselves off, and we go, I'm going to start making my way to Galilee. And for some of you, might be some extreme steps you need to take. Some of you, you, you need an extreme place. Some of you, it's, it, it's time to check in to the rehab center. It's time to check, it, it's time to check into the rehab center. Uh, by the way, recovery is not something that we're embarrassed about. By the way, it, it's why it's called celebrate recovery and not endure recovery. It's not like get through it, reco- find recovery. It's like, no, no, we celebrate this. Because every single one of us will find ourselves in a situation, oh, I gotta get back to Galilee. I gotta get back. You're in this room, and that's you. I want to tell you, his grace is sufficient. And though your sins were like scarlet, he's washed you white as snow. That is the best news you're ever going to hear in your entire life. Come on, can we stand to our feet, Grace City?